Well, good evening and welcome. I'm glad you're here with us on this Wednesday night and uh, grateful for the many other people that are here on the campus as well this evening. I want to greet you. also want to greet those that are uh, watching online as well. We're glad that you are here. If you would, take your uh, prayer sheet in hand and let's look on the back because we have a number of things that are uh, coming up. First of all, this Friday, the Troy Burns family is in concert, and I hope that you'll be back for this Friday's concert. It starts at 6.30. It's uh, dropped off of the, uh, of the prayer sheet for some reason, but, uh, but you be here this uh, Friday night. You will be blessed. And then let me really begin pushing the Senior Adult Luncheon. Joe Kirkpatrick is going to be our Senior Adult uh, Ministry Leader this year, and uh, I'm planning on going. It'll be Thursday, February 16th. We'll meet here at the church, but if you want to go and meet at Garden View Baptist Church, it'll begin at 10.30 a.m. These folks are punctual. Uh, you will be uh, finished eating and leaving by 12.30. I want to encourage you to come and take part. It's going to be a great time. This coming Sunday, I'm, uh, I'm excited about preaching Sunday morning the gospel of Isaiah. And you're thinking, did Isaiah have a gospel? Of all the Old Testament writers, Isaiah tells us about the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the suffering of Christ. It, it tells us about uh, Christ's victorious resurrection. So much is in the book of Isaiah, and it presents the wonderful gospel message. Listen, you can witness using the book of Isaiah I'm looking forward to it. You know, so many of these prophets, uh, all you see is judgment upon Israel and judgment upon uh, uh, Judah. But Isaiah goes much farther. He shares with us that in addition to the fact that, yes, sin brings judgment, that God will provide a Savior. And so I'm looking to forward to this Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, we're having a first Sunday sing on February 5th, let me encourage you. I'm looking out at some folks. You can sing. Uh, you can play a kazoo. Uh, I saw another church's fifth Sunday sing recently, and I assure you, if you've got any music in you at all, you come share it this coming Sunday night and praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And, uh, just so, and if you're not sure if you can do it, do it with Angie. Angie will help you. <laughs> She'll true. sing with you. I Amen. Will. She will help you out. So, uh, so let us know if you'd like to take part in the, fifth, in the first Sunday sing on this first Sunday in February. And then you see that our preschool is going to have a Prince and Princess Ball for those little preschoolers. And uh, uh, that's a lot better than what they did when I was a little preschooler. <laughs> we had a Tom Thumb wedding. And uh, y'all probably never heard of that. But uh, all us little kids, we exchanged uh, little plastic rings just so the adults could have punch and cake and we could go out and play on the playground. Amen. But uh, anyway, it, that'll be a lot of fun for our preschoolers. Uh, I hope you have your prayer sheet in hand. You can begin looking those over. I want to point out over here on our table, uh, there are these little invitations to come and hear the gospel at Uly Baptist Church. Uh, Using these, Wayne McInturf uh, puts these together. You can hand them out. You can leave them somewhere uh, where someone can uh, receive the gospel. And it's uh, like a gospel tract that invites them to Uly Baptist Church. If you have a prayer request tonight, uh, utilize one of our prayer sheets. In a moment when we stand to sing and greet one another, you can utilize the prayer sheet uh, over here on the box. If you would, let's stand together. I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer. And then we'll greet one another. And John Michael, you and Angie give them plenty of time to greet each other. That's a great part of the worship service here at Uly Baptist. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this time together. And Father, I pray for us as we gather tonight that we would praise your holy name, both in music and in the word. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, Christ came into the world to die for our sins. Help us tonight to, uh, 
uh, to experience the joy of salvation through worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, turn and greet one another. Take some time. Wave to one another. Go hug other children's neck. Then turn to 132. We'll start tonight with Hosanna. Praise is rising. Praise is rising. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day, and in your presence, all our fears are washed away, they're washed away, Hosea. saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound. Hear the sound of hearts return. To you, we turn to you in your kingdom, and in your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna. 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 560. Oh, how I love Jesus. a name I love to hear, I love to sing His worth, it sounds as music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth, oh how I love Jesus, oh how I love Jesus, oh how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me on the last it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below oh how i love jesus 
Because he first loved me. Number six, how great thou art. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe. And when I think, and when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Well, amen. Before I even begin with uh, sharing the scripture. John Michael, I don't see the light on the camera up there. Is it still recording? Okay. And for those of you that are watching over the internet, we are delayed broadcasting tonight uh, because uh, the live stream is not uh, working like it normally does, but we are recording, so I'm thankful that you're joining with us as well online. Well, tonight we are continuing in this series, A Faith That Keeps Working. And tonight we're going to look at the mirror of God's Word, and we find James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, where James tells us about how God's Word acts like a mirror in our life. If you would stand with me as I read this passage and you uh, read along with me, either on the screen or using the Bibles that you hold in your hand. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 22, he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face, in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we are thankful that you give us your holy word that reveals to us what we need to change, 
and reveals to us who we are, but also reveals who you are. Father, I pray tonight that if there's someone here, someone that's watching over the internet that needs to make some commitment even tonight, Father, I pray that when we come to the time of altar call, of invitation, that they would respond, whether they're here or whether they're watching over the internet. Father, every time we hear your word proclaimed, every time we study your word in a Sunday school class or Bible study, even every time we study your word as we have our daily quiet time, Father, help us to be hearers and doers and to respond. And now we pray these things in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I heard about a businessman who had been away on a business trip, and he wanted to go home and make sure he had a gift to bring to his wife. You know, me and Donna, whenever we're going away, uh, nowadays it's, it's all about the grandkids. Amen? Amen. You got to pick something up so that when we get back, we have a, a T-shirt or or something that uh, that we can give the grandkids. I like getting the grandkids things, especially if they're noisy and obnoxious. Amen. They can take those home, and uh, it's just one way I get even with my children. I I send the grandkids home with uh, loud and obnoxious toys. Used to be able to get them from the dollar store. And uh, while I'm chasing this rabbit, uh, let me give you some suggestions. Those, those noodle swords that they can play with, and uh, uh, those are obnoxious. When it, and, then, and then loud things, you know, like those bouncy balls that you, uh, that, that you hit. Uh, my grandkids say, Papa, Mama's just going to take this stuff away when we get home with it. But anyway, I, I like to take the grandkids' things when I've been away or when they've been with me. But this man came back from a business trip, <laughs> and he said, you know what, I, I'm going to stop and pick something up for my wife so that when, when I show up, I have a gift to give her. So he went into the department store, and he immediately went to the cosmetic counter and said, uh, you know what, I, I, I'd like to get my wife a bottle of perfume." What do you have? And she came out and, and had a bottle of perfume that was uh, rather exclusive. And he said, well, how much is that? He said, she said, well, that'll be $180. <laughs> he said, wait a minute. Uh, do you have something else? Maybe something that's not quite as expensive. And she said, well, let me look. And she brought out another bottle of perfume and said, well, that one's $150. He said, that's still quite a bit of money. Maybe you have some smaller bottle of perfume that maybe I could take. And she pulled this tiny bottle out and said, this is $25. He said, I don't think you quite understand. I'm looking for something cheap. What can you show me? And she handed him a mirror. <laughs> you see, he was kind of cheap. You know, in my ministry, my last church where I was an associate pastor, the accountant and the business administrator said, you know, our senior pastor has never seen a dollar he didn't want to spend, and Doug Sides has never seen a dollar he didn't want to hold on to. Listen, I'm pretty cheap, amen? Somebody told me I squeak when I walk, but I don't know. Well, today I would like for us to look at what we really are. When we look into the mirror of God's Word, I, I hope tonight we will, we will take a look and a hard look at who we really are, not what others might perceive us to be, not what we show on the outside because we want to give a show to other people. In fact, I don't even want us to, uh, to look at what we used to be Tonight, as we approach the Word of God, I hope you'll join me in prayer right now and say, God, reveal to me through your Word who I really am. Because in our text, the Word of God says that the Bible is like a mirror. 
Look at verse 23 in our scripture. It says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And if you have a King James Version, that word glass there is referring to a mirror. The Bible speaks to the fact that not only is the Word of God a mirror, but also that the Holy Spirit who dwells in the heart of a believer, that the heart is like a mirror as well. The scripture says, as in what her face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects man. In other words, in that day, you could also, many people would look into a, a pool of water and, and see their face. And it says, you know, the heart also reveals what a man looks like. But in our text, it says that God's word shines like a mirror. I believe that an essential part of every worship experience is looking into the word of God and saying, God, reveal to us who we are. In fact, the Bible commands us to examine ourselves to make certain of our faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us that it's our job to judge everybody else. In fact, we're the witness to other people. But the one person that the Bible says you must judge is yourself. You have to look in the Word. You have to look at your life and say, God, help me to see who I am. Help me to see who you are and help me to examine my relationship with you. Evidently, some of the saints that were scattered abroad were not doers of the word, but they were hearers only. If you remember, the book of James is addressed to the saints that are scattered abroad. They were, they were being persecuted. And listen, even these persecuted believers were being encouraged to examine themselves, to be careful that they weren't simply hearing the word. In fact, James divides the people into two kinds in the church. No, it's not the pillars of the church and the caterpillars in the church. You know the difference between those. The pillars are those who support the ministries. The caterpillars are those who kind of slither in and slither out of the service and you never see them again. No, James divides them into the doers and the hearers. You see, some of the saints living then were just hearers only, but I'm afraid that some of the people even today that attend churches are not doers of the word, but are hearers only. You see, the word doers carries the idea of working and serving. Giving everything that we have in mind, soul, and body, to serve the Lord, to obey Him. Hearers, in our text, is referring to those people that are just passively sitting in the audience. They don't want to get too involved. They're just passive. There are a lot of folks, I'm afraid, that are attending churches across America. In fact, they're attending churches across the world, and many of them, don't really want to get too involved. They just want to come sit in here and go out the same way they came in. But James says, when you go to church, when you worship God, when you study the Word of God in your quiet time, you need to be more than a hearer. You need to do what the Word tells you to do. You know, one brand of athletic apparel has a little swoosh as their trademark. In fact, I don't have to say any more, do I? It's Nike. They got that Nike swoosh, and their logo is what? Just do it. That's it. 
And so if James was going to give a title, I think, to this portion of Scripture, he may say, swoosh, just do it. Listen, don't just be a hearer. Do what God's Word tells you to do. Now I'm going to break this up into two categories. First of all, we're going to look at how you approach the Word of God because some people give the Bible a glancing look while others will give it a gazing look. Let's look first at our first point, the glancing look at God's Word. And we found that in verses 23 and 24. I want to read it again because this is Bible study night. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. James again is comparing the word of God to a glass or to a mirror. Every kid at some point, especially little boys, they got to figure out, how does that mirror work? Anybody else done that? And, and you broke it, and you took it apart, and then you were scratching the back of it, and you found out that it was just glass with something on the back. Uh, listen, I remember as a kid, I was just fascinated with stuff. I was good at taking things apart. I just couldn't get them back together again. You know, that wasn't only a problem when I was a little boy. That's still a problem today. Amen. Listen, I, I remember when I tried fixing my car. I thought anybody can fit, put in spark plugs. About five, six hundred dollars later, when they had to retap the engine and put new spark plugs in, I, I learned, you know, whatever I do, don't invite me over to help you fix your car. Amen. That is not my gift. Well, I had to take that mirror apart and see what it was like. You know, I, I think on the back of that is some kind of silver. Maybe at one time they used mercury or something. I'm so old. How old are you? I'm so old. I remember every kid in the neighborhood had a little box with mercury in it. Every, every, if, if you're that old, raise your hand. Look at that. I got a I got a room full of people that are going to admit to being that old. Yeah? And, and we would play with that stuff. Maybe that's what's wrong with me now. Amen. You just, you just wonder. Well, James says that the Word of God is like a glass, and I've done my best to explain that what he means by that glass is a mirror. Can you imagine somebody going to the mirror in the morning looking at themselves and saying, wow. And then just throwing on a pair of pants and going to work just like they looked when they got up. I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time before coming out before you folks tonight. I did my best to look as, as good as I can possibly look, and it's getting harder every day, amen? What amazes me about mirrors is they even make these mirrors that magnify. I looked at one of those one time. You know, when I had my eye surgery done, I looked in the mirror and I thought, man, I didn't realize just how ugly I am. Amen. I, I looked at that mirror and thought, goodness gracious, I didn't know I had those wrinkles because I, I could see much better. Can anybody else relate to that? The older you get, the more you kind of stare in the mirror, and you do your best to look as good as possible before you go out. But James says, here is a man that looks into the mirror of God's Word, and he goes out, and he forgets what he looks like. That's like a guy that wakes up and looks in the mirror, like that one right there, and he says, I, I'm not going to fix myself up. I'm going to go to work. And his boss says to him, Sir, do you have a comb or a brush that you can fix your hair? And he says, well, yes. And he said, but sir, do you have a razor blade that maybe you can trim that up or fix your face a little bit before coming to work? Yes, I do. And then the boss says, well, you know what? Instead of just looking at the mirror before you come to work tomorrow, how about doing something about that? Amen? Well, God says that. 
because a greater tragedy occurs when a man only glances at the Word of God and then does nothing about what he sees. He reads the Bible. He sings the songs. He knows the teachings. But he never experiences a change in his life. Why? Because look at your scripture and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That's the plight of the glancing response. You come to church, you hear the sermon, you read the Bible, you go to Sunday school, you talk about the Word, and then you leave, and there's no inward change. Well, second, let's look at the gazing look at God's holy Word that we find in verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, James now describes somebody that does more than glance at the word and then goes away without any inward change. In fact, here in this verse, the word looketh means to to gaze intently, to look carefully. That same word in the Greek that James uses here was used in Luke 24, verse 12, where it says, Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher. This is after Jesus rose from the grave. And he stooping down, he beheld the linen cloths laid by themselves. That word behold there is the same word because Peter was, he was amazed. Jesus has risen from the dead and he's looking into the grave and he sees those grave cloths and he's not just taking a little glance. He's examining these things. The same word is used in John chapter 20, verse 11, for the same thing. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, and here it says, looked into the sepulcher. You see, there's a great difference between just taking a casual glance and now gazing. Let me give you another example from our home because my wife is good at finding things. Amen. But my children, they would say, well, I don't know where that is. I can't find my brush. I can't find my socks. I can't find this or that. But then Donna would find it. So what was the difference? The difference was that the children, uh, they just kind of glanced and said, I don't know. Where Donna, she intently looked and found what we were looking for. Notice how James describes God's Word. First of all, he uses the word perfect. God's Word is absolutely perfect, my friend. Every prophecy about Jesus has been fulfilled. When we look back at the law, the books of the law, I want you to know, I believe the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis Anybody else believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Amen. I'm glad I'm in a church like that. You know, one of the questions that we're going to ask as we are looking for a new director of missions and associational mission strategist is do you believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Because I'm going to tell you, I don't want us to bring somebody here that doesn't believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. In fact, I don't want us to bring anybody to serve in a ministry role in our association, in our denomination, or in our church that doesn't believe the whole Bible, amen, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, because this word is perfect through and through. It is inerrant. It is infallible. This is God's word. Second of all, it is the law. This is not a book of God's suggestions. God's doing much more than giving suggestions. He's giving us commands. That if you're going to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
This is how you must act. Now, we don't act that way in order to be saved, but because we are saved, the Bible says this is how believers should live. It is not a suggestion, it's a command. And then third, did you notice that it is the law of liberty? The truth shall set you free. I think that's one of the things that is so frustrating about our day. <laughs> it doesn't matter what news story you see. You don't know the truth. I even have a hard time watching the NFL right now. You see, I, I think anybody playing the Chiefs, man, those referees, they just throw the flags, amen? But that's just my bias, and I'm, I'm straying from the message here. But, but, but you may feel also, you think, goodness gracious, wasn't that just called roughing the passer? But, but not when the Chiefs do it, amen? Well, I'm just showing a little bias here. Can I get any amens to that? Amen. Well, you just don't know what the truth is. We're living in a world where you don't know what's the truth. But I know this. This is the truth. It is unbiased. And unlike a referee that Sometimes call something on one team and then not on another. This book's going to apply to every one of us the same. Amen? Uh, it, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done. I'm going to tell you, this word cut straight. And it applies to everybody equally. But I also want to say it's the law of liberty. Because listen to me. The Bible doesn't put us in bondage. That's what sin does. The Word of God sets us free. It tells us what's right and what's wrong. It tells us how to get right. It tells us how to stay right. It tells us how to live right. And that's why it is so important that the man of God stand in the place of God and preach the Word of God as true because it is the law of liberty. And notice that it comes with a promise. God promises to bless the person who will heed his word. The key is, did you see that? Continue therein. Keep on looking. Don't just glance. Keep on gazing at the word of God. Let me close with this, and I... I know I've shared this story before. <laughs> I used to love, as a kid, to go to the fun house. In Tampa, you had a place called Lowry Park. It's now the Tampa Zoo, but when I was a kid, it was Lowry Park. And they, they had this old World War II bomber that they brought in that kids would climb on. You'd climb on it, then you'd climb in it, and then you'd climb out on the wings. Listen, I can't tell you how many times I'd fallen off of that thing. That made a generation of kids tough, amen? Today, somebody's going to get sued when the kids fall off. But, but in those days, man, they, they'd bring that old World War II stuff, and they had it set up out there, and you'd climb all over it. And they had an old rickety uh, roller coaster out there. I don't think any of that stuff was safe back in the 1960s, but, but we had fun there, Amen. And they had these, uh, these, uh, these monkey bars. Not like what kids get today. I mean, these were monkey bars. Uh, I think they were two-story high. And, uh, and you climb up. They made kid tough in those days, didn't they? It, it was tough being a kid when, when I grew up. But when I was a boy, one of the things they had at, at Lowry Park was a fun house. They had a house of mirrors. Anybody ever get stuck in one of those? Anybody like going to the fun house? One of the things they had was they had mirrors. And, and they'd show you something that wasn't real. Because of the curve, some of them would make me look real tall. <laughs> and you know that's not true. 
And then they had others that made me look short and stocky. And, uh, and, but then they had one mirror that just showed me what I really look like. And in the end, that's usually the one that I took the biggest glance at. The mirror of God's Word tells us to do much more than take a glance. It says, gaze at your spiritual condition. Make certain that you're looking into the Word of God and that you're examining yourself. One of the other things that the Word of God reflects is it reflects the love of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's Word reflects not only God's love, but it reflects God's plan of salvation for every person who will repent of sin and turn to Christ. That's why Jesus said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. That word repent doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but it means you don't want to sin anymore. It means you want to have a change of life, that you see yourself as a sinner. But you see the love of God and the holiness of God and turn to Him and receive Him. But as many as receive Him, to them gave He the right to be called the children of God. Would you receive Him? Do you trust Him? Are you doing more than glancing at the Word? Are you gazing into the holy law, the law of liberty that sets you free from sin? that gives you the assurance of eternal life. Do you know for certain that if you were to leave here right now, something were to happen, do you know that you know that you know that you have a relationship with Jesus? You see, that's why God gave us the mirror of His Word. So we can know, we can have that assurance that we can receive the Lord. I'm going to ask every head be bowed and every eye closed. Father, I pray for us tonight, and I pray that if there's someone here, someone watching online that does not know for certain they have eternal life, Father, I pray tonight that they would receive you into their heart, that they would trust you completely for salvation. Father, there may be a believer that has looked into your holy word tonight and realized that there's some change they need to make in their life. Father, I pray the moment we stand, that if there's someone that needs to come, that the moment we stand, they would step out and come to you. And I pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus.